Life is way too short to focus on all that's wrong with the world. I'm Thomas Roberts. We love you. We see you. We hear you. We know you're there. So thank you for doing this, Thomas. This is Gay Good News. Give me 30 minutes and I'll give you a rainbow. Hey, everybody. It is great to have you with me today. It is Thursday, July the 9th, 2020. Uh, hopefully you all had a great holiday weekend for July the 4th. I know we did. We had some friends over, very small group, and I bought one of those guns, you know, the uh, temperature guns, and luckily everybody passed. We didn't have any trouble, uh, and everybody was not offended by it, which was interesting, but also nobody showed up wearing a mask, so, but I didn't have a mask on either. Uh, I don't know how you feel about the mask thing. Uh, I know I wear mine when I go out, but here around the house, not so much. Uh, speaking of masks, we are fully stocked for our masks. So if you would like to get one of the Gay Good News masks, just go to our website and you can get a mask for yourself. That's Mom and Aunt Pat. They proudly have their masks. They love them. They're very comfortable. Uh, but, you know, masks right now are really a fashion statement. You know, you can see brands that are getting into making and designing masks, and you see things from as basic as a regular hospital-style mask to anything from some fancy designer like Louis Vuitton. Uh, but they're genderless, right? Uh, they're pretty uh, taste-specific, or not, not taste-specific, rather, when it comes to gender. You know, anybody can get away wearing any kind of mask that they want. Uh, and it is a choice, you know, how to express yourself. Well, it's interesting to think about a void there was in the fashion industry uh, for those that were uh, gender non-conforming, uh, for those people that want to express their gender through fashion. Where were they going a couple of years ago to do that? There really wasn't anything. There wasn't any place to go. Uh, Rob Smith saw uh, a business opportunity. But beyond that, he saw a way to give back to the LGBTQ community, a community in which he is part of. And the Fluid Project was born. And here we are two years later, and now they have developed into something well beyond Rob's dreams. Take a look. And we welcome Rob Smith, who is the CEO and founder of the Fluid Project. And Rob is an old friend of mine. Uh, it's great to see you, Rob. Thanks for doing this for me. Great to see you, Thomas. Happy to be here. And you've had a lot going on in the last couple of years with the Fluid Project. And just to tell everybody watching, you had a really successful fashion industry career. And you used that as a springboard into the Fluid Project. So explain what the Fluid Project is first. Yeah, I want to say, you know, the idea of the Fluid Project is basically the intersection of my career, which you mentioned, which is fashion. I was worked with big companies like Macy's and Victoria's Secret and Levi's and Nike with the intersection of my passion, which is social justice, specifically around LGBTQ uh, youth. And merging it together, I created the Fluid Project, which is this amazing you know, place, it's a, it's a gender-free shopping experience, you know, so there is no boys or girls section, you know, the whole world is very binary and we broke apart this binary construct and created space specifically for transgender and non-binary young people or all people who could shop without gender limitations. Um, but the company is also built on really a value system and a value system where we challenge boundaries with humanity and really do it with in a very positive way. Um, but we also find this great place of intersection of fashion with activism and community and education. So this is like, this is um, a reflection of my entire belief system. Yeah, I was gonna say it's, it's one stop shopping for a lot of things. For a lot of uh, things, Because yeah. when, when you think about it though, and coming from your career perspective, the, there, there's nothing like this, or there was nothing like this. Uh, it's kind of, kind of amazing because when I searched it, like I realized that I, I created the world's first gender-free store, the world's first one. It, it, amazing. And, then, and when you're in your 50s and you think you've done, you know, what are your chances of doing something nobody's ever done before? We 
we actually, you know, look at the people that are untraditional and mm -hmm. that's who we celebrate the most, you know, the world, the world needs that, you know, this reflection that, oh, I see myself in this model, right. which means that it helps elevate your existence. Yeah, representation really matters. And yeah. as we've just come out of June Pride, where everything was canceled and we lost a lot of our media coverage, that was the whole reason why I wanted to do Gay Good News. Yeah. We need a place to actually talk about our issues, to celebrate our people, to recognize our straight allies, but also it, it's um, not a concept we should leave behind just in June. You know, it's something we need to carry all year long. Uh, sure. And that's why the, there's an article that you were featured in uh, that talked about LGBTQ brands that we need to support all year long. It only listed five and, and you were one of them. Uh, but how important is that, that, that you're not just around for June? Well, I think it's pretty important. I mean, you know, um, it's about a third of our sales happen in June because mm -hmm. suddenly the spotlight is on the LGBTQIA plus community. But we're, as we know, we're, we're alive 365 days a year. You know, we are working hard to lift ourselves and our community out of, you know, marginalized spaces and go from under, underrepresented communities to successful flourishing communities and businesses and individuals. And so, you know, one of the things that I always encourage people to do is to do your homework, find out who, own the, who owns a business, you know, what kind of value system do they have? Who is the, what does the team look like? You know, is it, is it full of representation of the spectrum of our community and support those organizations? I think that is the new norm. I think as we have been awoken even more than ever through Black Lives Matter, floating into pride and continue to people mm -hmm. look at you know, there's something called pink washing, where if you just march down a parade in New York and that's it, check a box and you, you think you're good, young people are not going to tolerate that anymore. You know, people are doing research and they're understanding what the complexity of the executive board is, the board of directors, mm -hmm. their leadership team, and where their money's going. So um, we are awoken and it's time for us to all, you know, put our money and support our communities. I think what you're doing is tremendous because, like you said, you, you're filling a void that had, that had been um, totally unrecognized. Yeah. Uh, and, but now, so the store, uh, that's, not, that's not around anymore, right? The, the brick and mortar the store, location is gone. The most magical place, and I still get notes from people who are so upset the store is open, but to put in perspective, we were open almost the same amount of time as Studio 54. And Studio 54 <laughs> had such a cultural impact. And, and I think Fluid has too, you know, I, I still like have 40% of our following is international, you know, that people would come to the U.S. and right. their first stop would be the store. So, you know, it really opened up lots of opportunities by having the store, um, by people are aware of the brand, they know what we stand for. And it, and it changed a lot of uh, um, folks' minds who even just like walked in and were like, what is this? You know, and they left and they, they're like, you know what? I got it. Like they needed something physical sure. to experience yeah. to understand it. And when you think about like this t-shirt, like why should it be gendered? Why should lipstick be gendered? Why should, you know, a dress be gendered? Just, just wear what you want to wear and be who you want to be. And everybody get out of your way and let you be your badass self. Oh, uh, one of the things that is non uh, gender specific Face masks. And I understand that you've got some great face masks. Well, yeah, we, um, we tested them. We sold out in, in, in 24 hours. And they, they're just like, um, just like our T-shirts. We tend to come with these positive, optimistic sayings. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about, you know, this face mask covering, you know, possibly the most important part of your face other than your eyes to express yourself. So we did some, I have a few here, but like, this is a great one that says spread love, not germs, which I think is pretty <laughs> awesome. Uh, we always sell be kind, so we've got a ton of be kinds. And then um, because we're proud 20. Oh, I love that. That looks good. Days a week. And then this one I love, like a uh, smile. Um, anyway, we're selling them like crazy. Macy's just bought them. Uh, we're uh, just and we're selling it through our platform. And the nice thing is 20% of all the sales from all of our product are going back to the community. So we're not just giving back to organizations like Marshall P. Johnson Institute and other organizations, but just this week we 
allocated $1,500. And if you are a young, queer, brown, black individual, we just Venmo $25 to anyone who needed money. And it was so much fun wow. just like giving money directly to individuals. Oh, I bet so, that felt great. Yeah. And so like if you need food in your pantry, if you need a Metro rail card or whatever mm -hmm. you need, or you just need something to like help get you by, we just sent you $25, no questions asked. That's amazing. Yeah. And it was so good. Uh, you gave no warning. It was just kind of like a pop-up. Yeah. Venmo, yeah. A Venmo yeah. Uh, notice yeah. comes to you. That's it. Just put your Venmo in our feed and we send you money. It was great. All right. I'm going to go do it right now. <laughs> uh, you, you can actually, yeah, no, <laughs> you can go add on top of my, uh, my $25 if you want. If, but okay. it's for people who can also see individuals who are looking for money and need money. You can also add on top of that. So. But you if you know, need $25, Thomas, I'll send you some money. Thank you. You know, it, it really is it's a whole new world when you think about it and, and how uh, we, we interact, communicate, transact. Uh, where do you see uh, the Fluid Project going in the years to come? Yeah. Um, well, you know, it's interesting. I'm doing some interesting work. So there's the retail business will continue to grow online. Mm -hmm. um, we're working on some strategic partnerships with other retailers like um, where we don't have to own the space, but we'll come in and we're working with brands like uh, large department stores. I, I can't say names, but um, I, I want to get back to pop-ups. I want to mm -hmm. travel around the country. I really want to get to the South. Like I was talking to someone about being in Atlanta and I want to get to come on where I'm ready. I'm ready. And, and we're also um, going into education and training. We're helping companies who, need to get ready for the gender expansive workforce. So I've got something called Get Fluid and we train companies to get ready for transgender, non-binary um, individuals, not just workforce, but also consumer base. And then- um, And we're meanwhile, also, though, I mean, and it's- Yeah, no. To get ready, it's like to get ready. They're, they're already there, you know? Uh, You're right, they're already there. They're our colleagues already, you know? <laughs> and our friends. They are. And we, we need to create safe and affirming spaces so they can come out. I mean, you and I probably hit ourselves, our sexual orientation when we were young. Yes. When we were young, we, we worked hard to hide our identity because of discrimination, right? Fear and discrimination. And that's happening right now with transgender and gender nonconforming folks. They're hiding in their company, their identities because they're fear of discrimination. Mm -hmm. So it's our job as responsible leaders um, to to lean into this space as opposed to lean away and say this, this I'm afraid I'm going to misgender somebody. I'm afraid I'm going to screw right. up. That's right, not right. right. Let's That's just leave it alone. Let's just keep it the way that it's always been and pretend it doesn't exist. Right. And that is a form of discrimination. And it's, and it's, it's not just unfair. It's illegal now with title seven happening. Mm -hmm. You know, um, title seven allows for uh, gender identities lead to be legally um, represented through the law. So, I tell people, don't just do it because it's the right thing to do. Now you got to do it because it's the lawful thing to do. Mm -hmm. And so we, um, all of our trainers are, are gender nonconforming. Uh, they're transgender, uh, non-binary, you know, multiracial, um, really just incredible humans. And they're the trainers. And then I'm helping companies walk into this space. Like I'm helping somebody who says, hey, we want to enter this space, but we're just a little nervous about how to do it. And we don't want to screw it up. So I come in yeah. and I help. I just work with Procter & Gamble. Um, and some other companies and how to enter the space with authenticity. Yeah, and you, and you get to hire from the fluid family too, which is great. So explain, how come the PH instead of the F? It's a great question. So, so it starts off with the whole idea of fluidity and fluidity is the ability to navigate easily between two spaces and these binary spaces. And so, um, you know, the spaces could be the fact that there's freedom between male and female and gay and straight or black and white or Republican and Democrat. And we become so such binary, you know, uh, society yeah. that we're, we're labeling these boxes and generation Z is not, they don't see themselves as one or the other. They're not this or that they're this and that. And so it's like embracing this idea of the space between where you can float and play and be creative. And the pH I put on the front because pH stands for balance. And the idea that there's this balance in Love all that. of us. And when we have balance in ourselves and in society, we become much better. And project at the end, because it's a work in progress, because it's something that will never be complete. 
but it's a collective group of people working together to make something better. So that's why it's called the Fluid Project with a PH. I love it. And we are all a work in progress together. Uh, Rob, thank you. I appreciate you joining me. Absolutely. I appreciate being here. I appreciate this program. Keep spreading good news. My God, there's enough bad news. And what you're spreading, the, the goodness you're spreading is so appreciated. Just keep doing what you're doing. I will. Thank you, Rob. I'll talk to you soon. Appreciate you. It isn't Rob great. There is the website, and Pat, specifically for you, The Fluid Project. I also texted you so you can find it. Uh, but they do such incredible work. Uh, and Rob has really devoted uh, the last couple of years of his life uh, to this work. And I find it really interesting uh, how this is not something that he has been personally impacted by. And that he, he went into this community to gain their trust and to, to prove his you know, merit and uh, to, to prove that he was there uh, with good intent, uh, but also to provide community around shopping, which is really cool. Uh, but I just love what they do. So the fluidproject.com. Uh, and also, someone that is really good about gender expression in dressing, this is my mystery tease, all right? Why did an interview today uh, with someone that will knock your socks off? So good. Uh, I want to tell you more. I really do, but I'm not supposed to. It's just supposed to tease it. Uh, but it's so good. You're going to love it. But that's my, that's my clue about uh, someone that uses their clothes for expression and political statements and... Uh, really gets attention doing so. All right. So, uh, attention. I have got a couple for you that knows how to get attention. They are good looking. They are smart. They are kind. They're funny. Uh, and they know what they're doing when it comes to TV. I'm talking about the Holderness family. Now, you probably remember them from 2013. They had that viral Christmas card. Uh, it was called Christmas Jammies, and they're performing in their matching jammies in the front yard. Well, they have taken that viral video, and they have turned it, they laugh at me when I call it an empire, but they have turned it into an empire, and they also happen to be our allies. Take a look. And we welcome to Gay Good News, the Holderness family, and we've got the patriarch and the matriarch and Penn and Kim. Guys, it's great to see you. Thank you so much for having us. We're so excited to be yeah, here. It is an honor and a privilege. No, I, I, first of all, I'm big fans, huge fans uh, of your work. And then, Penn, when I saw what you did after Pride and the post that you put up about how to be an ally beyond Pride, I was like, yes, I can, I can reach out and convince them to talk to me, uh, which you so graciously responded and, and were willing to do. But just explain the post that you put up and, and why you did it. Yeah, so, uh, you know, you learn stuff from your parents. You learn good stuff and you learn bad stuff from your parents. And uh, I think a lot of sexism and homophobia and racism comes from being taught the wrong way by your parents. And I was like so lucky to have been taught the right way from my parents. I had a dad who was a pastor in a Southern church. And so you tell that to people now, you're like, oh, well. Well, we that, know about you. That must have yeah. been an experience. But my dad, he wrote this sermon exactly 25 years ago, or almost exactly 25 years ago to the day, uh, about um, what he thinks the church's stance should be on gays uh, in the Presbyterian church. And some of the language is a little bit different. We actually had to finagle it a bit because no one really knew how to talk about it correctly. Mm -hmm. But the spirit and heart of it was unbelievable that he wrote it 25 years ago. He, he took a personal stance and said that everyone that he had ever talked to, because back then when you were gay, you didn't go, uh, you didn't go to your family. You went to your right. pastor because you were afraid. Um, and he talked about the, the culture of fear that surrounded it 25 years ago. And it was, it was real, particularly in the South. Uh, and how, you know, really, in his opinion, people shouldn't live in fear. They should be universally accepted and that you can find that in the Bible. And I remember being blown away by it in the pulpit. I remember him warning me that some bad things might happen, and they did. A lot of people actually physically got up and walked out of the church. 
because he was asking people yeah. to like extend their arms and if you re- like to, to like welcome mm-hmm. the, the LGBTQ plus community in a way that churches did not do 25 years ago. Mm-hmm. And I thought, and if, if you get all that context and, and it really, so Penn found the sermon because his dad, oh, yeah. both of his parents um, have dementia and they're living in skilled nursing homes. And so we had to actually go through um, and, and kind of like do all the stuff you have to do to clean out the mm-hmm. house. And he went, Penn went digging. He's like, there's a, and his dad kept all the sermons. He's like, it's in here somewhere. It's in here somewhere. And, and he Dale found, found it. My brother found yeah. It. And, and he, we, that's the one we've saved because, like he, he, the night before he's like, people are going to walk out. We're going to lose. And you know, as a church is kind of like a business. You need people butts in the seats, right? Yeah. So he lost a lot of people, but then that he shepherded people through and it really became this like great, inclusive, welcoming church. And it's really an example for us all that. Yeah. Even when like maybe the butts in the seats that aren't agreeing with you, you still need to say what's right. So it was revolutionary 25 years ago. And even looking back on it, there's so much like that, that has changed even, even since then. So, yeah. yeah. Meanwhile, when you mentioned 1995, I mean, I don't feel like it's that long ago. I mean, uh, you know, I, we're not that old, right? I mean, um, I mean, I, <laughs> years. I mean, I was still like high school, but still. Right. <laughs> no, you're, you're absolutely right though. I mean, I, that, that's right when I got out of college and I was petrified about coming out there was still a huge stigma about the AIDS crisis. And if you were gay, you were going to get AIDS. Uh, but I found it fascinating because there were five points to your dad's sermon. Uh, and the one where he said that, that they're born this way. Uh, basically, that's, this is not a choice. And that, that was huge for 25 years ago because so many, uh, so many preachers, so many churches were teaching that this was a choice. And I think yeah. that's where that probably was, you know, ground shaking uh, for members for members of your church uh, but did you ever talk to your dad about why he gave that sermon or what brought him to those conclusions I can only I can only guess it was because it was what it what was in his heart um, I, I know for a fact that he's always been a very positive accepting person he had spent a ton of time before then um, trying to support like members of the marginalized community in Durham. Mm-hmm. He's from Durham, North Carolina. There was a ton of poverty downtown. He helped found this, uh, this urban ministries center that, that helped keep homeless people off the streets. And I'll be honest with you, I think he kind of equated the, the people he worked with there with the gay community because of the same things, because of being marginalized, because of being afraid and using, you know, trying to find like, an accepting tool for that. Um, Mm -hmm. I know they're two totally different things, but that I think. And he did tell us at some point, this is years ago that, um, that they, he did have people confide in him. that didn't feel safe to tell their own family. So he's probably Mm -hmm. standing up there defending these people. Right. And he's sitting in the pews right there. They're sitting in the pews afraid to tell their family. Can you imagine that our kids wouldn't have feel comfortable coming to us to say who they are like that just blows my mind i mean it's, I, and it still happens it still happens we, like we've been lucky enough kim and i have had friends uh come out to us like as before they came out to their parents yeah and it was it's like one of the so most special. incredible experiences you ever have in your entire life because like there's nothing but love like, this person has entrusted you with like an unbelievable secret yeah. and then it, it just instantly becomes a celebration so it, uh, that what happened about 10 years after this sermon um you know but just going back and thinking about back then when it wasn't it was like a and it's so funny that people think because we're like this like middle class white family we had a lot of people post like oh i they were surprised that we had ideas about inclusion and diversity well i wonder i wonder (laughs) because because you guys don't really take big political stands i mean you we can depend on you to uh provide great yeah. entertainment great family fun i mean you know we can we, relate we to have, all of you yeah, yeah but we have those don't necessarily go viral i mean definitely want our whole thing is like we want you guys to laugh and we want right. you but we want people to laugh at us with us it doesn't matter just laugh you definitely want a safe space to laugh but also we're humans first and like we need to show our humanity so throughout this like 
we posted, we went to a Black Lives Matter protest and we've shot, I mean, we have shared in the past, like we have shared fundraisers, we have shared it. That stuff doesn't, it's not what we're known for, doesn't necessarily mm -hmm. go viral, but we have showed it because I think it's important right now, especially that if you have any microphone at all, any platform, you have to stick up for people. But let's, let's talk about your other work. Okay. Do it. Yep. Yeah. But could you have imagined uh, where this would have taken you seven years ago? No, absolutely not. I mean, seven years ago, he was watching your face at 3.30 in the morning, yeah. right? You were in a, a different seat seven years ago, but here you are along with Kim, and now you guys helm an em empire. Uh, wow. I can basically say that. I think it's an empire. Yeah. Let's 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 go with a moderately crappy regional cable TV station. Sort of. yeah, like, I mean, that might be a better metaphor. This computer is sitting yeah. on a pile of laundry. So yeah. let's it not. Is. It's it not is. The, yeah. It is. No, I mean, look. Th there's all these little micro uh, uh, stations. I mean, <laughs> empires. I'm laughing when I say that. Uh, and if you can, if you can find something that you truly love to do and try to keep the authenticity, um, you can make a living off of it. And we've been very lucky to do that just by kind of looking at each other, betting on each other and, and, and trusting in each other as far as like what we're putting out here is, is gonna be good. And that's been the, it's not always good. Let's be yeah. honest. Well, Kim, I wanted well, to ask I mean, how, how tough is this on a marriage? How tough is it on a marriage? Cause you're, you're not only in business together, well, it's not a couple and, and yeah. as parents, but now you're also out there in the business world, uh, yeah. working together as partners. I think yeah. it intensifies the roller coaster that everyone has when they have a relationship, don't you yeah. think? Yeah, and so I think we've become, I think a lot of relationships that for my friends are talking about just being quarantined with their spouse and how hard it is. That we, we've been doing this for seven years. Yeah, it was good COVID training. Yeah, we've been, <laughs> so it, we're good. Uh, in fact, to the point that we actually just wrote a book to print it into the publisher it's going to be i think it goes on sale next march yeah but about the mm -hmm. you know the 10 fights every partnership has and how to get through them because we wrote it with our marriage counselor because we've been to counseling but i think we fight really well yeah. i think that's the benefit of and we get and we're very our, our marriage is very resilient so mm -hmm. we fight we fight well and then we get over yeah. it real quick. And also, this is an important thing. We went to counseling not because our marriage was in dire trouble, but because we just wanted to get better at it. Everyone, mm -hmm. I would say on average, most people go to counseling when they're already in trouble. And we have this belief that you should do active work on your marriage and your relationship. And that's what this book is for. It's, it's not for, I mean, most, if you look at marriage relationship books, most of them are called like the final straw. It's like a picture of like someone like like this. doing this. Like, yeah. And like, that's what, but there's a lot of them. And ours is like, Hey, hey guys, everyone read this book. You need this book. Um, yeah. You know, if, if your relationship is on the verge of collapse, maybe go Not to a counselor, book. but everyone else read this book. Then, then, and how do you get the work done? So you've got that, that's that project going on at the same time that you've got the other inventory of work that you've uh, mastered you know yeah how, how yeah. does that work where do you find it's, the time it's not a boring day uh, i will say can i brag on you for a second sure so i come up so the role it works like this like and i said so i said hamilton's coming out on disney plus you should write a hamilton like mashup or something just write something about hamilton he sits down with his computer in about 12 minutes wrote that Hamilton, he wrote a, a kind of a parody, a mashup of like three Hamilton songs about putting on a mask. He wrote in about 12 minutes. He went upstairs, I hit record on the camera. He recorded it in eight minutes and it was a really easy, so like he did that all within like an hour and a half. So he worked his brain. It's like cartoon yeah. characters in there. So um, take so that Lin-Manuel Miranda. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh. Mic drop. You, you, you try to write something like that, even though you're the one who originally wrote it. <laughs> Boom. Is that how things typically work with your brain, though, when you guys are coming up with a, a new parody? Is it that? Is it typically that quick? Um, so I have a theory that two. It's a two-part theory. Number one is that uh, true inspiration is finding an idea that's already out there, and when you find it, it should be very, very easy. It should just flow out of you. Um, the other, the other part of the theory is that if I spend more than 30 minutes on something and I'm not done with it, it's going to suck. Well, 
Guys, it's been so nice to talk to you. I really appreciate it. Uh, uh, thank you careful. so much. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you guys, okay? Aren't they great? Aren't they, they are. They are some of the nicest people uh, that I've ever zoomed with. <laughs> uh, they are really fun and kind, and we chatted for a while after the interview was over uh, because this is like the wild, wild west to me. Trying to do this, uh, you know, gay good news and try to figure out all the uh, details that need to go into it. And they're like my new mentors. So Penn and Kim, thank you very much. They were great. And could you imagine? Uh, like, like 12 minutes to, to, to write, write that parody, parody and then another, you know, eight, eight minutes here and then eight, eight minutes there. But in an hour and a half, they could have it all done. Uh, that, that is talent. talent. All, all right, so one, one picture. Don, I'm going to pull this picture. picture. Uh, this, this is one, one of my favorites. favorites. That, that is me and Wonder Woman. Woman. That is Linda Carter, uh, a friend of mine who I, I love. She is... I'm going to try to get her on this month, maybe in August. Uh, we've been uh, texting back and forth, but she's on the show every day. She's behind me. Uh, but if you have any questions about who's on the shelf, I am happy uh, to show you. Uh, oh, look, and Penn is watching. Look. Yeah. Well, you are too kind. Thank you uh, to you and your wife for making time uh, for our show here. I appreciate it. Uh, another person that made time for our show... I'm going to give you a little tease. It was a great conversation. We talked for like an hour. And I, I, I couldn't get it on today because uh, there was so much good stuff. But here is a little something that is coming your way next week. We just want to fight to be who we are. And we want to fight to love and be loved. All right. So Lady Holiday, Jennifer Holiday, is going to be our guest next week. And then the mystery guest I told you about. So there's a combo. Two good guests next week, you know, trying to evolve and uh, the, take the show, you know, to a better look and a better feel and make sure the technology is good uh, and make sure that the guests are great for you and uh, that the conversations are great for you, too. So thank you for your time today. Uh, we will see you next Thursday. You can always find us on our YouTube channel. Just go to YouTube and look up Gay Good News. All right. Have a great week, everybody. Take care.